Hello everyone. With patch 10.2 on the horizon, as well as BlizzCon around the corner, and apparently, if I read Twitter right, the last major patch for this expansion, I figured it'd be kind of a good idea to recap what happened so far. For those that might be coming back into the game, for those that are still playing it, list off what happened in Dragonflight, what did we do, and perhaps find out what was the point. The world has been sundered. It cries out in pain. Over 10,000 years ago, the world of Azeroth fought out the so-called War of the Ancients. Victory was earned, but at a great price, as the world sundered apart, magic drained from the land, and their dragon isles went dormant. This forced the dragons to leave their home behind, but they did charge some watchers to keep an eye on the place, hoping that someday the elemental energies would research again and draw the dragons home to re-establish their kingdom. It took a bit longer than they expected, over 10,000 years. But the call has gone out, for some reason, and I don't think they've explained exactly why. Hello there, uh, me from the future. I posted this question on Twitter as well to find an answer, and it was Malganeer, who runs a friend lore channel. They directed me to an interview up on the millennium.org website. Here they speak with Steve the Newser, and they ask the same question. On sait que c'est Koranos qui a éveillé les îles aux dragons en rallumant le fanal de tir. A rough translate comes down to, we know that it was Koranos who awakened the Dragon Isles by relighting the Beacon of Tyr. But to this day, we don't really have any context about what made us go to the Dragon Islands. Who or what awakened Koranos? Was this some kind of immune reaction from Azeroth after enduring successive attacks from Sargeras, Nazov, and Zoval? What's up with Koranos and the Dragon Isles waking up? Does this have anything to do with Sargeras, Tab of the World, the events with Nazov and Zoval? To which Steve says, we. Oui. Ces dernières années, il s'est passé pas mal de choses en Azeroth, comme vous l'avez mentionné, Sargeras qui blesse le monde avec son épée géante. Which again, excuse the rough translation, comes down to... Yes, in recent years, a lot has happened in Azeroth, as you mentioned. Sargeras hurting the world with his giant sword, Azerite starting to erupt, leading to a war for acquiring this new power. Zoval, who attempted in the Shadowlands to tear away the world soul of Azeroth to rewrite reality itself. And all of these things had an effect on the world. As we already know, there exists this world soul, which has been dormant for a very long time. And regarding the awakening of the Dragon Isles, you should know that it was not Koranos who triggered it. He was only reacting that the earth all around him was awakening. This is an indication that the world soul, which has been dormant until then, is beginning to stir. And this awakening is something that's begun to manifest itself in Dragonflight. But this will also be the theme that continues to be developed in the future. This is a story to follow as it develops. So yeah, from this interview, we get the confirmation that Azeroth was hurt quite a bit in the past. But now, you know, cleansed from the old gods, she's been healing the five-year time skip. I believe it was five years. She's now starting to stir. I haven't seen any story related to Azeroth itself in the game. The elements just kind of wake up and we're not told why. We're just told that they are through the primalists suddenly showing up. We're not told where they have been either all this time, but we are told that they were there, that they showed up. So yeah, there's... Still a bit of fair storytelling that needs to be done in-game. And this is not entirely out of the blue, though. Like, Azeroth awakening, the elements waking up as well. She has been hurt before, and then started to consume these elemental forces. And it seems like her healing now, that's what causes the elements to become more dominant and active again. At least, that seems to be where they want to take the story. Once again, a big thank you to Melganeer for directing me to the millennium.org website. Thankfully, they've done this interview, because otherwise, we wouldn't have gotten our answers. The elements have researched, their call went out, they started searching for their lands. Meanwhile, Stony Tony deactivated their cloak device, kicking off a brand new expansion, kicking off Dragonflight. Now not just the Isles woke up, the Dragfear did as well. These are hidden forces, once created by Nelfarian, or as most of you know him as Deathwing the Destroyer. He used a Titan relic to keep complete control over his forces, but he lost it during their war with the Primal Incarnates. While well, the war would be won by the Dragon Aspects, and the Primal Incarnates were locked away. Deathwing no longer trusted the Dragfear to follow his lead on their own accord. With the aid of Melagos the Blue, the Dragfear were locked and hidden away, placed within magical slumber. For nearly 20,000 years now, they've been kept underground. Now, in the current day, as an ancient magical surge ripples through the forbidden reach, the Dragfear, awaking from the long slumber, straight into battle, because primalists led by Kurok Grim Totem have shown up to liberate Razagev, one of those primal incarnates defeated and imprisoned by the aspects. We're unable to defeat her right here, 
she flies away to go and liberate her siblings. Now, some of the Drakfir then decide to join either the Alliance or the Horde. Some of them decide to do their own thing, travel the Dragon Isles and help out where they can. And some of them decided to become our enemy and form the Sundered Flame. Their vow to serve the dragons was sundered, just as Nelfarian had broken their promises to them. That set the stage to go into the actual Dragon Isles, discover this long lost place with rich ties to dragon history. On the Waking Shores, we joined Raphion on his quest of claiming to see the power for the Black Dragons, as well as the Seat of Leadership, as he wants to be their aspect. Surprisingly, he was not the only one. Sibelian has returned from Outlands, and the two not-really brothers then are going head-to-head to earn the favor of their flight while fighting off any enemies, like the Jardin, mighty dragon hunters of the past. On the other side, we follow Alex Straza, who goes head-to-head against Razagev, reclaiming the ruby life pools, the ancestral nesting grounds for their five flights. The Unarn Plains revealed ancient centaur, having a conflict with each other as the primalists fuel the war effort. We side with the Maruk, learn more about the history with the green dragonflight, and secure the lands by taking out the primalists. The Azure Span is all about the blue dragonflight, and we even get a chance to party with a simulacrum of Sindragosa. Sindragosa before she became all undead and screamy. Caligos learns all about family from the Tusker, and together with Katgar, manages to fight off Razagev. While some of his flight has answered the call to come home, not all return to their aspect. Oh yeah, and uh, there's also some decayed knolls. Teldresses houses the capital city, as well as the Vault of the Incarnates, the place where Razagev's siblings are being held captive. Here, we can help out Chromie, Nosdormu, and the Bronze Dragon Flight with some wacky adventures through time. But his ultimate fate of turning into the infant dragon Morusant still looms on the horizon. After leveling through the Dragon Isles, we get more familiar with the locals, and we earn renown with the Dragon Scale Expedition, the Maruk Centaur, the Ishkara Tusker, and the Vel Dragon Accord. We learn a bit more about our allies and the lands that we party in. Hints at why there was a war between the Primal Incarnates and the Dragon Aspects. Hints at how Keeper Tear and the Titans might not be as great as we thought. Perhaps we can ask him some questions when we're done rebuilding Keeper Tear. We also managed to bring the Green Dragon Ysera back from the Shadowlands by having Malfurion take a nap in her stead. She will help guide her daughter into a role as Aspect of the Greens. And then finally, our overarching story that was to solve some of the problems that the different flights were having and then re-empower them. Make them proper aspects again, since some of them have died and all of them have sacrificed a huge chunk of their powers to stop Deathwing at the end of the Cataclysm. But we've made some great beginnings at fixing these problems. A lot still needs to happen. And Queen Alexstrasza's attempt at gaining their powers back, that simply fails. No matter though, heroes still rise up and save the day into the vault of the incarnates to stop Razagev from releasing her siblings. The primalists that try to stop us, like Kurok, are wiped out. Thunder Chicken also goes down, but not before opening up the prisons. Virak, Viranov, and the Riddokron take over the torch from their sister, they become our new threat to focus on. With Razagev gone, the storm she placed upon the Forbidden Reach disappeared. Forbidden Reach being the place where she was set free, where the Drakfir came from. And we uncovered more of the history of Nelfarian and the Drakfir. The Sundered Flame also proved themselves quite the opponents, but Skill Commander Emberfall remains at the side of the Black Dragon Ebonhorn and is determined to bring her kind into the future, into a new peaceful era, opposite of what Skill Commander Sarkarev and the Sundered Flame wants. In the meantime, the Incarnates do not sit still and have created a path into the Zaralek Caverns, where Nelfarian's secret laboratory is kept. Virak is asked to go down there and consume the powerful substance of Shadow Flame, fire infused with shadow, who had been partially responsible for the madness of Deathwing. We quickly follow, of course, Raphiana's rebellion bickering along the way, while Ebonhorn keeps a cool head and steps up in the role of leader. Despite that, we are still unable to stop Virak here, and the Blazing One does what he does best, torches the town of Loam, home of the Niffins. We can't exactly do something about him now, a threat for another day while Virak torches the land above. Instead, we turn our attention on Abrus, the Shadowed Crucible. This is Nelfarian's hidden laboratory where he performed some foul experiments, worked on creating the Dragfear. In the end, we see Sarkarev fully embracing that legacy, the powers of the Void, believing himself to be entitled to Nelfarian's legacy. Those who have been paying attention though, you know that that is one full of death and destruction. Not surprising that Sarkarev is dead on the floor, or Raphion and Sibelian, they decide that Ebonhorn is their best pick for new aspect of the flight. 
That's the black Dragonflight sorted, but we also dealt with the blue. More of their flights have returned home, but several are in need of some assistance before they can make the journey. Cindragosa, Melagos and Senegos. They're sent off into an eternal rest, bringing together the family like never before. Honestly, this is one of the better quest lines that they've ever done, which brings past, present and future all together. Definitely worth your time to check out. And speaking of time, let's move on to the Bronze Dragon Flight. Their aspect Nosdormu has known for quite a while now that his fate is to be to turning into Murazond, a corrupted version of himself that would lead the infinite Dragon Flight. Instead of guarding the so-called true timeline, he would go against it, betray everything that he stands for. Not to worry though, Chrome is gonna do anything she can to prevent this, leading us into an adventure against her infinite counterpart Morchi. Through the dawn of the infinite we went, while Iridacron sided with the infinite for some nefarious purpose. The timeways took us back, all the way back to the dawn of the aspects, where they took on their first threat together, Galagrond, united they managed to bring the behemoth down, and they would eventually be empowered to become the dragon aspects. There, we find ourselves on a crossroads. We first stop Iridacron from sucking some kind of power out of the corpse of Galagrond, but that meant the corruption of Nosdormu into Morazond. So, we tried it a second time, this time focusing on preventing the corruption first. But that meant that Iridacron got away. He now has a disc brimming with whatever power he took out of the corpse of Galagrond. Besides him in the portal is a shadow, a shadow of what we speculate to be Zalatov. I think it's pretty safe to say that Iridacron is partying with the powers of the void, but all of that is still a story to be told. In this moment, it seems like Chromie has done it. She's managed to stop Nosdormu from becoming Morusant. And he's even been trying to see things from the perspectives of the infinites. Oh, and the Dragfear unlocked a brand new spec to play. Augmentation, a more supportive role to perform. We also saw the remaining Sundered Flame return into the fold, stepping away from Sarkar's schools and joining our side. So Iridacron is out there somewhere, potentially gonna be a bridge into the next expansion. But his brother and sister, Virak and Viranov, they're busy trying to gain entrance into the Emerald Dream, the domain of the Green Dragonflight. Inside, there grows a new world tree, one born of the sea to give to the Night Elves by Elun and the Winter Queen. This happens during the Shadowlands. It holds the spirits of their people that burn with Teldrassil, their hopes and dreams for the future. This tree must be protected, but Nosdormu can sense that it might actually burn. That's Virak's goal anyways. The corrupted with fire within is pushing him to extremes. So much so that Viranov, she decides that she can no longer stand with them. Despite their history, the war over not wanting to be aligned with the titans, with the domain of order, the millennia of imprisonment that had followed, despite all of that, Viranov wants what is best for the world and its children, and so she warns Alexstrasza of what is to come. They were once extremely close, and again the queen asks her to stand with them. Despite claiming that all she had left was vengeance, this time Viranov accepts. Meaning that she's now with us, going into the next patch, Guardians of the Dream. We have dealt with the black, blue and the bronze storylines, time to now deal with the green dragon flight, and maybe at some point also the reds. Time's gonna tell I suppose, but for now, thank you very much for watching everyone. Subscribe if you like my videos, leave a like if you enjoyed this one, and until next time, see ya!